Sparks and Mayhem, where I tell you a true crime story and we drink. The following content may be disturbing to some. Discretion is advised. If you choose to enjoy one of our themed margaritas, please ensure that you are of legal drinking age and have fun but drink responsibly. Flashed across the headlines in the late 2000s, so many people have heard of it. It inspired a movie called Lucy in the Sky, an episode of Law and Order Criminal Intent, and many songs, including one by Ben Folds. I, for one, only really remembered the headlines until I started researching it. Be warned, this one makes me pretty cranky. And the diapers? Well, that's a bit of a source of debate. Today's margarita is inspired by this, of course, crime of passion. You'll need to do some preparation for this margarita. I managed to snag some passion fruit syrup from Amazon, and that's probably what you'll have to do if you don't want to make your own passion fruit syrup. There are lots of recipes for passion fruit syrup online if you don't want to buy it or you can't buy it, but that's going to require passion fruit, water, and sugar, of course. So for this recipe, we are mixing two parts tequila with one part lime juice and one part triple sec. After that, for our passion, we're going to add two parts passion fruit syrup. This is replacing our simple syrup in this recipe, and there we go. You're going to want to shake well to combine. And pop off the top. Bougie strain, as usual, over fresh ice. And for today's drink, I did a salt-rimmed glass. I think this drink could be good with a salt or a sugared rimmed glass, so uh, you get to decide. Lisa Marie Caputo was born on May 10th, 1963, to parents Alfredo and Jane Caputo. Her father was a computer consultant and her mother was a biological specialist. Lisa was the oldest child. She had two younger sisters, and they all grew up in Rockford, Maryland. In 1969, as a five-year-old, she watched the Apollo 11 moon landing and became fascinated with the space program. She told her mom that she wanted to be an astronaut, and even as a child, she became hyper-focused on that goal. She loved visiting the National Air and Space Museum and was heartened when women were allowed to become part of the space program in 1978. Lisa was ambitious and a perfectionist, according to many people who knew her. She excelled in academics as well as sports such as field hockey and track and field, and she was in student government and she attended church every Sunday. She was also a member of the French Honor Society and competed on the math team. Lisa was also incredibly competitive, even from an early age. Her classmates remembered her as wanting to be first in everything, from field hockey to academics. And in academics, she was number one. She graduated as the valedictorian of her class. By this point, she'd already been accepted into Brown, a prestigious Ivy League university, and the United States Naval Academy. Her parents tried to convince her that Brown was the better option, but remember, Lisa wanted to be an astronaut. She believed the U.S. Naval Academy was the best way to make that dream come true. So that's where she enrolled. When Lisa entered the U.S. Naval Academy in 1981, she was in only the fourth class that accepted women, as the U.S. Naval Academy only opened up to women in 1976. Even still, only 6% of the student body was made up of women, and because of that, she often faced harassment from fellow classmates and sometimes professors. Nonetheless, Lisa excelled at the academy, competing in track and field and meeting her future husband, Richard Nowak, who was also a student at the academy. Lisa graduated on May 22, 1985, with a Bachelor of Science in Aerospace Engineering. 
and she became a commissioned officer in the U.S. Navy. No one can say that Lisa wasn't a smart lady. For her first assignment, Lisa chose a six-month appointment at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, of course. There, she would work as an aerospace engineer for Ellington Air Force Base. While there, she watched six space shuttles launch and solidified her dream of becoming an astronaut. In 1985, she was accepted into flight training in Pensacola, Florida, which is an achievement for anyone, but particularly for Lisa as a woman, this was a pretty rare feat. She married Richard in April of 1988 at the Naval Academy Chapel. They would have their son in 1992. In the early 1990s, Lisa continued her education. She earned both a master's degree in aeronautical engineering and further degrees in astronautical engineering. In June 1995, NASA announced that they were going to be accepting applications for a new group of astronauts. NASA received 2,400 applications, including Lisa's. In May of 1996, NASA announced that Lisa was one of 25 mission specialist candidates. Lisa, Richard, and her son moved to Clear Lake City, the waterfront area of Houston that is home to Johnson Space Center. There, she started astronaut training on August 12, 1996. While there, Richard had several jobs, including as a flight controller for mission control at Johnson Space Center. As you can imagine, it's not easy to become an astronaut. Astronaut training includes survival training, studying geology in the Grand Canyon, as well as classroom training for all of the various controls on the space shuttle. They had some training in the waters of the Weightless Environment Training Facility, and of course, the Boeing KC-135 Stratotanker, otherwise known as the Vomit Comet. Fun fact, when I was uh, in sixth grade, I actually went to space camp, and I also got to go into basically a version of the Vomit Comet. I did not throw up. In 2001, Lisa gave birth to twin girls. In 2002, Richard was called back to active duty as a part of Operation Enduring Freedom after the September 11th attacks. This left Lisa managing life with three children and continuing to work as an astronaut. In January of 2004, Lisa participated in a cold weather survival training exercise in Canada. She was there with several astronauts, including William Opheline, otherwise known as Billy O. This training basically just dropped them off in the wilderness of northern Quebec, and they just had to make their way back home. When Billy O and Lisa returned home, they actually started an affair. They worked to hide this affair for several reasons. First of all, both Lisa and Billy O were married to other people. Secondly, adultery is a crime in the U.S. Navy, and you can even be court-martialed for it, and they were both active members of the U.S. Navy. Billy O's wife filed for divorce in February of 2005 after discovering emails written between Lisa and Billy O. He moved into a small apartment, and Lisa had a key. Lisa did fly in space. They launched on July 4th. 2006, actually, and during the 13 days that they were up in space, it was Lisa's responsibility to manipulate the robotic arm for a variety of tasks between the space shuttle and the International Space Station. Lisa did her assigned tasks, but many of the members of the crew really didn't like Lisa. They said she pretty much refused to help out with tasks that she hadn't trained for or that weren't assigned to her. She wasn't too much of a team player. Lisa and Richard's marriage had obviously been disintegrating for some time, but they had agreed to stay together until after Lisa went to space. He ended up moving out just before Christmas in 2006. Also in late 2006, Billy O started another relationship with U.S. Air Force Captain Colleen Shipman. She was working as an engineer at an Air Force base in Florida at the time. Billy broke things off, sort of, with Lisa in January of 2007. According to him, he thought she took it well and that they had decided to stay friends. Around that same time, Lisa was passed over for the next space shuttle mission because she hadn't been a team player the last time she'd been in space. 
Suffice it to say, things were not going super well for Lisa at this point. Evidently, however, she still had that key to Billy O's apartment. At some point, she went over to the apartment and did research on Billy O's new girlfriend, Colleen. She managed to find her personal contact information, including her home address, and information for a flight back from Houston to Florida that Colleen was taking after coming to visit Billy O. At the end of January in 2007, Lisa started to make a plan. She printed off maps. Remember back in the day before GPS, you had to print your maps from MapQuest? She had printed maps, she had lists, and she went shopping. On February 4th, 2007, Lisa packed a bag. It had a black wig, a trench coat, a hammer, latex gloves, plastic tubing, plastic trash bags, and several other items in it. Did I mention BB gun and ammunition? Well, it had that in there too. Did I mention an eight inch folding knife that she had written on a list as knife sharp? Well, it had that in there too. She also packed $585 in cash and four brown paper bags that ended up having 69 orange pills inside that were never publicly identified. She loaded up her car and drove 900 miles from Houston to Orlando and to the Orlando International Airport. It's important to note that she actually did stop for the night. That kind of got mixed up in the news. She checked into, I think, a La Quinta hotel using a fake name and paying in cash. Anyway, she ends up at the Orlando International Airport where she knows because she was in Billy O's apartment that Colleen is landing on her flight back from Houston. Okay, let's talk about the diapers. Early news reports stated that Colleen also had in her car something called maximum absorbency garments. That's a fancy word for astronaut diapers. Fun fact, astronauts wear diapers, but really only during takeoff and landing, not the whole time. Oh, and also when they're like outside of the shuttle doing like, work on the outside. They're very absorbent, space technology. Anyway, she didn't actually have astronaut diapers in her car, but she did have a fair amount of regular diapers, which is a little odd because if you do the math, her, her twin daughters would not have been in diapers anymore. And some of those diapers had been used. For what it's worth, Lisa and her lawyer denied this fact like the entire time, but it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense for the Orlando Police Department to make up that fact. And it seems kind of logical if you're in a hurry and you don't want to stop. Anyway, on February 5th, 2007, Lisa arrived at the Orlando International Airport and waited for Colleen's plane to touch down. She went into a bathroom, put on the trench coat and the black wig. Colleen said that after arriving at the airport, she became aware that someone was following her to the satellite airport parking lot. When she got to her car, she heard footsteps, so she threw her luggage into her back seat, got into the front seat, and locked the door. Lisa sort of launched herself at the car, smacking on the window and begging for Colleen to roll it down. She was making up some excuse about how her partner had not come to pick her up from the airport and that she needed a ride. This struck Colleen as kind of odd because why would she be in the parking lot and not waiting in the airport or whatever, but she started to feel a little bit bad for this woman and so she rolled her window down just a couple of inches. Lisa grabbed a can of pepper spray that she had in her pocket and sprayed it directly in Colleen's face. Colleen, in obvious pain, managed to drive away from Lisa into one of those parking lot booths where she let the attendant know and the police were summoned. Several members of the airport division of the Orlando Police Department arrived quickly and saw Lisa throwing a bag into the trash can. Lisa was then arrested at the Orlando International Airport on a variety of charges. This included attempted kidnapping, battery, attempted carjacking, and destruction of evidence. Colleen didn't know it was Lisa Nowak until she had gotten to the police station. She didn't really have much interaction with Lisa, but she did say that Lisa had been stalking her for two months. 
The state's attorney argued that the facts indicated an elaborate plan to potentially kidnap and possibly murder Colleen. Police and the state attorney argued that Lisa should be held without bail, but uh, that didn't happen. She was released on bail under the condition that she wear an ankle monitor and that under no circumstances was she to contact Colleen. She was placed on a 30-day leave by NASA, and immediately upon return to Houston, she was taken to the Johnson Space Center for a physical and psychiatric evaluation. On February 6, 2007, Lisa pled not guilty to the charges levied against her. On March 2nd, prosecutors filed three formal charges against Lisa. One, attempted kidnapping with the intent to inflict bodily harm or terrorize. Two, burglary with a weapon, and three, battery. The Orlando Police Department had actually also recommended a charge of attempted murder, but prosecutors declined to file that charge. The police had begun to question Lisa sort of without her Miranda rights being read, or they kind of read them off and on for a while, and so that evidence was suppressed. She was allowed to remove her GPS ankle monitor in August of 2007 because, of course, she was. There was some debate for a while because of a report by a paramedic if Colleen had actually been pepper sprayed. So they took another deposition of Colleen's and, spoiler alert, she was pepper sprayed. The defense tried to get the search of her car thrown out, but that didn't fly. Meanwhile, let's not forget that Lisa was on probation during this time. She and Richard divorced in 2008, and she was given full custody of all three children. The Navy insisted that Lisa and Billy O be returned to the Navy from their NASA assignments because of their infidelity. But naval officials wanted to wait until after the trial to deal with the kidnapping charges before they took further action. And so she was allowed to return to work for the Navy. Early on in the pretrial proceedings, it was revealed that Lisa planned to seek an insanity defense should this go to trial. Her insanity defense was based on four major items. One was Asperger's syndrome, otherwise known as a part of the autism spectrum disorder today. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder, remember John List. One major depressive episode and or a brief psychotic disorder based on a specific stressor. More on these later. By May of 2009, it was determined that Lisa would not use insanity as a defense if this went to trial. Trial never happened anyway. On November 10th, 2009, Lisa pled guilty to the following charges. Felony burglary and misdemeanor battery. She was sentenced to one year probation and two days that she had already served in jail. She received no additional jail time. A Navy administrative panel voted on August 19th, 2010 to recommend Lisa be separated from the Navy with an other than honorable discharge. Do y'all remember the case of Zach and Addie? He received a general discharge. The discharge that Lisa received is one level below that. Remember that Zach received his discharge for failing physical exams on purpose. While Lisa drove 900 miles with the possible intent to kill someone. Seems like a big line between those two discharges, but okay. Anyway, the other than honorable discharge is the most severe of the discharges that doesn't require a court-martial. And it does ban her from entering the military again. She was permitted to retire from the military on September 1st, 2011. This evidently came with a reduced monthly pension of $5,300 per month. In March 2011, Lisa petitioned the courts to seal her court records, saying that it was causing damage to her family and preventing her from being able to find a job. And in the least shocking thing I've said this entire episode, the motion was, of course, granted. Despite a sealed court record, for some time, Lisa struggled to find employment. I mean, duh. Seems like her notoriety gave employers some pause when it came to giving her a job. Also, I mean, without doing anything, she's taking home $63,000 a year, which 
probably isn't enough for a more lavish lifestyle, but it is a pretty nice chunk of change. In 2017, it was reported in People magazine that Lisa was living a quiet life in Houston, Texas, and working in the private sector. Her attorney said she's doing well. She doesn't do interviews, and she tries to stay out of the spotlight. She's in her 50s, and her children are now in their 20s. William Opheline, Billy O, and Colleen Shipman actually got married in 2010 and moved to Wasilla, Alaska. You know, one of the homes of Sarah Palin, pretty close to Russia, I think. They had one child, and now Colleen is an author. She uses writing to heal from the trauma of the attack, and she's working on her memoir. That's one I can't wait to read when it comes out. Okay, let's talk about the diagnoses given to Lisa by the two psychiatrists that saw her after the attack. Remember, she was evaluated and diagnosed with, among other things, four major things. One, autism spectrum disorder, Asperger's syndrome. Two, major depressive disorder. Three, obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And four, brief psychotic disorder with marked stressors. OCPD, which we learned about in the John List case, involves people doing anything that they can to keep their life in the ordered way that it existed. This is a possibility, especially when you consider the way Lisa was in her early life, but it seems like, honestly, despite the planning, that Lisa really went on this path of quite disordered thinking in the days leading up to the attack and immediately following the attack. And I mean, having an affair doesn't really jive with the whole idea of OCPD in the first place. While it is possible for someone with autism spectrum disorder to lack the criminal mindset, it just doesn't strike me as this in this particular case. There's no way that Lisa could have made it as far as she did in the military and at NASA without both the ability to understand the difference between right and wrong and the ability to follow all rules. So while it's probable that she is on the autism spectrum, that doesn't really qualify for an insanity defense, at least in my opinion. A major depressive episode happens when a person experiences major depression for at least two weeks. I mean, this is something that I definitely think is true and definitely had a lot of triggers, but do I think this is insanity? Uh, and I'm not even really sure about the last one. Brief psychotic disorder with marked stressors. It's also known as brief relative psychosis. The psychosis occurs in response to a traumatic event that would be similarly traumatic for someone in similar circumstances at the same time in the same culture. I'm sorry, but I just don't think your ex getting a new girlfriend rises to the level of that kind of trauma in our society. Then again, I don't know her brain. Maybe I'm just annoyed that she went to jail for two days for something that was maybe possibly 100% attempted murder. In response to concerns over Lisa's mental health, NASA actually commissioned an independent panel to examine how well NASA attended to the mental health needs of astronauts. As a result of this panel, policies at NASA were changed in a couple of very important ways. Flight surgeons began to receive additional training in psychiatric evaluation. And although there was an unofficial code of conduct at NASA, an official code of conduct was written. Behavioral health evaluations are now included in every astronaut's yearly physical exams. But I will say this, from what I've read about the mental health of astronauts and other people working at NASA, I think they have quite a ways to go. There's a lot in the culture about not talking about it for fear of being grounded and other concerns. And so I think NASA probably has a few more steps they need to take in order to help astronauts that are struggling with their mental health. So what do you think? What caused Lisa to do what she did? Do you think Lisa would have gone farther if she could have? What stopped her from making those moves? Could you ever see yourself doing something so out of the ordinary? What do you think of her sentence? Does the punishment fit the crime in this instance? Was the demotion and retirement from the military plus being forced to leave NASA enough? 
Or do you think she needed more prison time or more help for her mental health issues? What do you think about her receiving full custody of her children after she had committed the crime? Oof, this case makes me really cranky. Who packs a bag with a BB gun, an 8-inch knife, plastic tubing, a hammer, a trench coat, and a wig, and drives 900 miles to confront your ex's girlfriend, and basically gets away with it? I'm not even sure if jail is what she needed or some serious mental health intervention, but instead she got nothing? Okay, she didn't get nothing. She got a sealed court record and $63,000 a year in her retirement straight from the taxpayers. I'm glad Colleen is living a happy life though. Thanks for hanging out with me. If you have an idea for a margarita or a case, feel free to join us on social media. The links are in the description box. We're doing a pretty interesting case next week, an art heist. Have you ever heard of the world's largest unsolved art theft? Well, if not, you'd better tune in next week. A tart cranberry margarita to honor the place where this crime took place, Massachusetts. Remember, I upload every Thursday on iTunes, Spotify, and a variety of other podcast apps if you prefer to listen to your true crime. A review on those apps is always appreciated. And if you prefer to watch, I'm on YouTube. I'd be super grateful if you do the youtube things. Like and subscribe. I'll see you next week, and remember, there are always alternatives to murder and skipping the rest stops.